Good afternoon and welcome to the Spencertown Academy Arts Center Festival of Books for 2020. Uh, I'm your host today. Uh, my name is Gerald Seligman. I'm on the board of Spencertown Academy. And uh, we are all online this year, unsurprisingly. We have both uh, many of our, our book sessions, some of which are already streaming on our YouTube channel. And we also have our special book room for our book sale, which you can check out on our, um, on our website, on spencertownacademy.org, unsurprisingly. So um, we've got, we're, we're kind of coming around the mountain at this point and, and ending some of our events. And we've got three more to go today with Richard Gare and, and two New Yorker cartoonists who he will be announcing shortly. And then tomorrow at 4.30, we've got Ed Ward covering the uh, history of rock and roll, two volumes he's written. And we'll be discussing that book and um, the history itself. And then finally, to end our festival of books, on Tuesday, we have Jill Lepore, the author of This America, The Case for the Nation. And she, as you probably know, is a, a, a New Yorker columnist. I believe she's a contributing editor. Uh, a brilliant historian and, and, and writer, and that should be a great discussion as well. So I would like now to welcome Richard Gere, and um, Richard Gere, and uh, to, to discuss his book. Uh, hello, Richard. Hi, hey, Gerald. Nice to see you again. Likewise. Now, now we have done a portion of this interview, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, pre-taped simply because uh, I wanted to be able to add in a lot of the cartoons that the cartoonists were talking about, but we now are live. I want to remind people that uh, as with many of these sessions, the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen is functioning, is operating. And if you have any questions that you would like to ask Richard, we will get to them at the end of this interview. Uh, so feel free to just type in uh, anything you may be wondering, observations you'd like to make uh, about the interview, about Richard and his book. So Richard, um, let's, um, let's begin the discussion. The book is, I only read it for the cartoons, and the subtitle is The New Yorker's Most Brilliantly Twisted Artists. Uh, how did you come up with that title? Uh, the, the, what the sub the subtitle or the title yeah, itself? Yeah, the subtitle. <laughs> I don't know how people come up with something because you because you know I only read it for the cartoons is pretty uh, uh, generic, I guess. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> it's um, a specific part of the title. Yes. Um, now I've known your work from decades ago, and you're mainly a music journalist. Uh, you've written and you currently you're writing for Rolling Stone and The Village Voice and. Uh, Spin and Relics and AARP, the magazine. Um, so how did it come about that you decided to do a, a, a book on, on cartooning? Um, well, first of all, I don't write, I don't still write for some of those places, but uh, you know, I've written for um, every magazine in New York practically. And uh, it was mostly music writing. And um, I'd been writing about music for a long time and I wanted to do something that was also about popular culture and that seemed as um, interesting and accessible and just downright, as downright popular as music. And yeah. uh, thinking about that, I thought about things that everyone loves. Everyone loves New Yorker cartoons. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so, Matt, more, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, and, and more specifically, um, uh, the direct cause was um, a friend of mine started editing an, on a magazine, a famous comics magazine called the Comics Journal. And he asked me what I wanted, if I wanted to write for it. And I said, uh, yeah, uh, I'd like to write about New Yorker cartoons just off uh, the top of my head. So I started doing a column uh, called Know Your New Yorker Cartoonist for the Comics Journal. And that evolved into uh, the book. And, and the book itself, um, Matt Groening, who we all know as the, uh, the creator of The Simpsons, uh, he said that Gare's knowledge of the history and culture of the magazine and his incisive revealing interviews make for great reading. Uh, uh, well, the, the fix was in on that. We were in Boy Scouts together. <laughs> the Boy Scout recommendation is nothing better. <laughs> you got, yeah, I think he was an Eagle Scout too, so you really have to trust him. 
So he he's can turn over his line. scout medal in his pocket exactly. now that he's done that good deed. Um, I'd like to go very quickly to the to the interviews, but before we do, I was hoping you would kind of set the scene for us a little bit um, and, and tell us about um, how you feel, this is from your introduction, how you feel New Yorker cartoons in some ways reflect on, on those of us who are looking at them and the, the ones we champion and, and show to one another. Would you read that section for us? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, okay. Uh, your favorite New Yorker cartoonists reveal your personality, and the refrigerator door where their works hang provide a map of your soul. They take ancient concepts of love, war, cats, and recast them in contemporary forms. Each weekly mixture provides a glimpse into the zeitgeist. Thus, the artists are something like soothsayers, peering into the collective unconscious to retrieve images and ideas that appear to have been meant for each other alone. How often have you looked at a caption contest winner and thought, of course, how could it have been otherwise? Which is precisely the light bulb moment each and every cartoonist aspires to week after week. The New Yorker, however, has always been about aspiration of a different sort. Most of its readers don't live in any of the five boroughs, although many probably wish they did. New Yorker cartoonists taught us what life in New York was like and much more. These deceptively innocent images are like modern cave drawings. There's the commuter, artist, prophet, punk, financier, husband, wife, clergyman, matron, ne'er-do-well, and panhandler. Besides translating New York to the world, the magazine's cartoonists mock her vanities while suggesting a thousand and one ways to spend time on a desert island, at heaven's gates, in front of a judge, with a couple of guys in a bar, hanging from the walls of a prison, or in any of the other archetypal scenarios the New Yorker has made part of our hive mind. And after more than 80,000 cartoons, the gags keep on coming with no end in sight in the somewhat lucrative aftermarket. The most widely distributed New Yorker cartoon, Peter Steiner's 1993 drawing of two dogs at a computer with one saying, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, has generated more than $100,000 in licensing and reprint fees alone. Mm -hmm. Cartoons may no longer be the mass medium they once were, but they're still earning their keep. Let's hope the same can be said for the fine artists behind them, most of whom toil in relative obscurity. Behind the drawings and gag lines are flesh and blend artist writers whose sensibilities have helped define the magazine. The New Yorker's cartoons may reflect an institutional aesthetic, but its artist's best work comes from somewhere deep inside them, often over the course of de decades without proper acknowledgement. Unfortunately, as in the greater comics industry, many of the medium's finest talents have disappeared without receiving their due and biographies, when they arrive, do so long after the Grim Reaper shows up at the door. And speaking of which, my favorite Grim Reaper cartoon is the one by David Cypress, where the scythe-bearing man in black offers a card to a startled occupant while saying, don't freak out, it's just to save the date. <laughs> and you say 80,000 cartoons over the course of time. Probably more like 85,000 at this point. Isn't that a re remarkable? Let's transition now to the uh, interview that you conducted earlier. And as I mentioned, I've, I've put in um, a lot of the cartoons that they're talking about. So it might be advisable for people to watch this as a, on as big a screen as possible uh, so that you can read the cartoons and the captions. But tell us about who you've chosen and why and, um, and who they are. Oh yeah, well, that's easy. Um, uh, uh, I'll just kind of speed read through their biographies, but uh, I chose them just because they're, uh, they each represented a generation, I think, of New Yorker cartoonists. Uh, I'll start with David. Uh, David Cypress grew up in Manhattan's Upper West Side. He studied Russian history and Soviet studies for two years as a grad student at Harvard, and then he dropped out to become a cartoonist. You decide if that was a good career move. David Cypress's first cartoon appeared in the New Yorker in 1998. His work has also appeared in the Boston Phoenix, Time, Parade, and Harper's. His books include It's a Cat's Life, It's a Dog's Life, It's a Dad's Life, It's a Mom's Life, and It's Still a Mom's Life. Uh, so uh, yes, he represents like uh, the uh, generation of cartoonists that, I, that editor Lee Lorenz introduced in the 90s. Uh, the other person, the other cartoonist we'll be speaking with, Emily Flake, began cartooning with The New Yorker in 2008. 
And Emily is the author of These Things Ain't Gonna Smoke Themselves, a love-hate, love-hate, love letter to a very bad habit. Mama Tried, Dispatches from the Seamy Underbelly of Modern Parenting. And her most recent book is That Was Awkward, The Art and Etiquette, Etiquette <laughs> The Art and Etiquette of the Awkward Hug. Uh, Emily also draws the Parent as a Verb series at the New Yorker.com. And she co-hosts a parenting-themed comedy show called Shit Show with NPR's Ophira Eisenberg. I hope I spelled, pronounced that right. And a monthly show called Nightmares with comedian Ken Catbird. That's great. Well chosen. And um, so we will go to the interview. Uh, but keep in mind that the, the microphone Richard was using was a little bit dodgy. However, the mics that both Emily and David were using are fine, so, so you will be able to hear this quite well. And then we'll come back um, afterwards and talk with Richard and answer some of your questions and take it from there. Thank you very much. Let's uh, run the video. Uh, hi, uh, I'm, my name is Richard Gere, and um, I'm the author of uh, a book called I Only Read It for the Cartoons, The New Yorker's Most Brilliantly Twisted Artists. And uh, I have the pleasure today of speaking with two of the New Yorker's most brilliantly twisted artists. Emily, like David, you've drawn a lot of cartoons about, mom, uh, about a mom's life too. And which today seems more fraught than ever for uh, uh, reasons we're all acquainted with. Mm -hmm. um, but could you talk about one you did several years ago that shows a mom uh, drinking wine while holding their child and saying, it's the magic potion that makes everything you say interesting. Sure. Uh, you've done a lot of drinking cartoons. I have done a lot of drinking cartoons. Um, yeah, stick with what you know, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, a lot of my cartoons um, sort of live at this intersection of parenting and being drunk. So make of that what you will. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was, um, you know, I actually, did that cartoon before I, I had a kid. And I just had this discussion with, uh, with Emma Allen, the um, editor at, um, the cartoon editor at the New Yorker. And that cartoon kills me because what I drew was not a child. It was a tiny adult in a larger adult's arms. Um, and like many things that I have drawn, I now look at it and I'm like, oh, um, and wish I could redraw it. But it turns out once it's in the magazine, you can't fix it. Yeah, uh, this is the, that's the image that people have of your child for the rest of her life. Yeah. <laughs> that was a great, uh, I should also say that I, I saw that thing you did with Emma Allen where you discussed how to draw children and, and uh, that was a great little, that was a great little drawing lesson. Um, thanks, that was, that was fun. Uh, and you know, <laughs> You also discussed how your um, drawing of the children have uh, evolved. Uh, yeah, no, you it know? changed I, a lot once I had a kid to look at all the time. People frown on you just staring at their kids if you don't have one. Um, but yeah, um, through close observation of my own child, I realized some you know, pretty basic 101 drawing truths about like head size in relation to body and eye placement on the face. You shouldn't actually have to have your own child to learn how to draw one, but that's the journey I took. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> uh, David, did you, did you, uh, you know, did you go to art school? Were you, were you, are you a trained uh, artist? or uh, did I'm, you... I'm self-taught. I've been drawing cartoons since I was about six or seven years old. Um, and uh, it's sort of what I always wanted to do with my life. I took a circuitous path there for a while, but um, no, I never went to art school, um, but I've looked a lot at art and I feel like I understand a lot. And um, I, sometimes I think that art school may have just confused me more than I needed to be. So uh, it did. My, my parents would not tolerate the idea of my going to art school. I wanted to. Uh, but that wasn't in their plans for their little genius. <laughs> uh, how, how have uh, Soviet studies um, influenced your uh, art, if at all? Well, it's taught me how to draw Russians. No, no, <laughs> just kidding. Um, uh, my, my interest in history in general has 
endures to this day, and I think it has a lot to do with my uh, my constant attempts at making politically themed cartoons, and also my use of. I often try to make points in my cartoons, especially my political cartoons, by putting them in a historical setting. So instead of a president, there's always a king uh, who is nameless and um, stuff like that. And so that's how my interest in history in general has affected me. Um, speaking of history, although it's more like recent history, um, one, of the, one of the cartoons uh, years that I've been most affected by recently was the one where you're in the Bergen Bergen F stop subway station, and uh, well, not you, but some guys are in there. And the caption is uh, due to an incident at the Bergen Street subway station. Everything has changed, and nothing will remain the same. <laughs> and it almost made me cry. It seems so poignant and today, and because we really don't ride the subway anymore, and so nothing really is the same. But you do that probably years ago. Well, um, first of all, it's one of those magical cartoons that happens in situ. Um, I wasn't at my desk. I was in the Bergen Street subway station when I, there was an announcement over the loudspeaker and that sort of popped into my head. And that happens once in a blue moon. And when it does, it's terrific. Um, and I think that living, being a New Yorker, this was a lot closer to 9-11 when I came up with that. Uh, uh -huh. Maybe not right after, but enough af and soon enough after that that still was what you thought about a little when you went down in the subway. Um, and so I think that played into it um, rather than it being a reaction to what's going on now. That, I originally drew that about 10 years ago. Uh -huh. And I have to say, it's my favorite cartoon I've ever done. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, it's a keeper for sure. It's, it's also specifically, it's a very specific New York City cartoon. You know, uh, there's only one... I assume there's only one Bergen Street subway station in the in the world. Um, and the three I'm, sure Emily, I'm sure Emily can relate to this, but I, I spent a really long time coming up with which subway station to use because the names you use in a caption are really crucial. Some names are funny, sort of, and some names aren't. If I had said 14th Street, it wouldn't have been the same. So. Um, yeah. No, absolutely. Somehow Bergen is 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 perfect. Yeah. I always associate it with um, Jacob's Ladder too, because I didn't grow up in New York. So the scenes in Jacob's Ladder where he's in the Bergen Street station are uh -huh. like my my first like introduction to that station. And when I finally saw it for real, I was very. It was like I saw like a movie star. Well, that's one of the, you know that's one of the. Um, really interesting things to be about New Yorker cartoons. I, di I didn't grow up in New York. I grew up in the West Coast. And New Yorker cartoons were how I learned about New York. That, that's everything I, knew. everything I know about New York I learned from New Yorker cartoons. Um, the three of us are uh, all happen to be Brooklynites, um, incidentally. But um, what do you think New Yorker uh, cartoons have taught the rest of the country, if not the world, about New York City? Hmm. Hmm. That's a really good question. Because I feel like the I feel like the lessons that the New Yorker cartoons have to give were kind of succinctly wrapped up in that Seinfeld episode of, <laughs> of their of like, you know, their reputation for impenetrability. So maybe maybe what people learned is we we think we're better than I don't know. I should stop talking. David, you answer this one. <laughs> Well, it's a, that's a tough question, but I, in the early years of the magazine, I think it definitely created an image of New York as the sophisticated place where everyone was wealthy and everyone drank martinis and that whole ethos. But I think right. in recent years, things have kind of loosened up in all kinds of ways, and there's no, there's no specific New York, and I don't think there's a New Yorker cartoon that necessarily displays the a, a, a particular particular image of what the city is like. Uh, cartoons have really changed. Perhaps it's because there once there was, at one point there was a particular New York, and now New York is becoming more like the rest of the country. I don't know that there was a particularly like one New York, but I think that there was one New York that was get, like was that yeah, the yeah, New York was sure. the mouthpiece for you know. 
Well, yeah, that kind of speaks to the like like New Yorker cartoons as sociology of uh, a certain uh, of the class of people who read the New Yorker, who for a long time were, uh, you know, rich, white, thin, and uh, you know, fairly, fairly, um, you know, monochrome in that uh, in that respect. I'll say this: that growing up here on West 79th Street. Every week when my parents got the New Yorker and I opened to the cartoons, I definitely saw a picture of a New York that I wanted to be in, not mm -hmm. the one I was in. I wanted to be in that really smart, sophisticated, um, artsy, cool New York that I saw displayed. And so part of my initial attraction to New Yorker cartoons was simply because they fit my fantasy of what my future life could be. Mm -hmm. Which was actually your present life. I mean, your present life back there. There I am, yeah. <laughs> um, Emily, you have a lot of, uh, lots of cartoons about the vanity of couples. And uh, I specifically, I assume, I mean, I mean, inspired by New Yorkers, I, I assume. Uh, like the one where this couple are out to dinner and the man asks, uh, how much do we leave, uh, how much do we have to leave to avoid a social media incident? Right. Uh, uh. <laughs> um, but then, you know, that's like, that's, that's, that's sociology. That's like, uh, that's where we are today, you know, where we, uh, 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 we're social, we're, we, we act according to how we are perceived by social media. Mm -hmm. um, but um, who do you think your demographic is? Do you have any demographic in mind these days when you're, uh, when you're drawing? Do you feel you have a specific audience? Who's uh -huh. your tribe? That's a good question. I don't know that I have a specific audience. Um, and when I write these cartoons, I kind of first and foremost try to make myself laugh. So if um, if that happens to be something that the New Yorker agrees is funny, then that's, that's fantastic. Um, I certainly sometimes try to like hit the New Yorker tuning fork in my head and and try to do things that I can just picture in the magazine, but then I also always like, you know, put in at least one or two that, you know, that are better for me. So, and sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. How about you, David? Has your, has your idea of, uh, of, of your audience changed over the years? Um, well, that's a complicated question. First of all, like Emily, doing cartoons to me has always been mostly a conversation with myself. I mean, I, um, I, I don't think about who's going to read it. I think about whether or not, as Emily said, it makes me laugh, or whether or not it makes a point that I'm interested in. Um, and that's the way to do it, because if you're fortunate, then you, you wind up doing work that's original enough and unique enough that the New Yorker will buy the work. Um, uh, so I don't ever think that think of my cartoons as being directed at, at particular people or particular kinds of people. Um, yeah, that, that, that's pretty much my answer. Is there ever any um, direction from the top down about what New Yorker cartoonists should be, uh, should be focusing on? Ever? Was Which there... top are you talking about? There's several I mean, I mean, well, yeah, well, former, formerly Bob Mankoff and, and now um, Emma, Emma Allen. I, I, I've never been edited or suggested to in the 20 some years that I've been contributing by either editor. Um, once in a while, there's a fact checking uh, thing or a grammar change in the caption. They always check that out with you, but never, I've never had that. But the direction you get is when you get rejected. Um, you learn over time that what's going to go and what isn't. And um, that's, that's the teacher in the New Yorker. Um, nothing else as far as I'm, my experience. I don't know about you, Emily. No, I think that's accurate. Um, sometimes when I would go in for the weekly meeting, if, if Bob was feeling chatty, he might, you know, like give some advice or like, you know, uh, tell me his thoughts on specific things. The only piece of direction I um, I got was from him and it was to stop drawing people so fat. So <laughs> so that's uh, that's about it. That's specific and perhaps useful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
how is the, has the has the process of submitting cartoons to the New Yorker uh, changed with uh, Emma Allen uh, replacing Bob a couple of years ago? Um, I I tend to email my batches in. Um, you know, going in. Well, I mean, pandemic aside, going yeah. in is still right. is still an option. I honestly feel like it changed it more when they moved to One World Trade Center. I th I feel like that changed the the entire sort of vibe of going in into the, the weekly meetings more than anything else. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, that was the big change. And um, I think it's been pretty consistent. Um, you send in your batch every week. I also email my batch in and um, wait to hear something back. And that's pretty much the way it's been since, for me since 1998. Um, there's a there's a difference between Bob and Emma in terms of their styles um, around this whole issue of you know what's accepted and what isn't. But other than that, nothing much has changed. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Would you like to characterize that difference? Bob was more matter of fact. Uh, Emma is always gets back to you with a cheerful word or a um, nice little note or a compliment and. It, I, Bob was fantastic. I mean, Bob is the editor who put me in The New Yorker, and I've all respected and learned so much from him. He just has a different style from Emma. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, would, I completely agree with that. Okay. Um, David, you've got a, a great cartoon. Uh, speaking of demographics, um, I, I love your cartoon. Uh, that is like a full-fledged display of, of boomer pride, where a grandmother is uh, telling her children, uh, telling her grandchildren, that's the Yardbirds begat cream. Spencer Davis begat traffic. Cream and traffic begat blind faith. Blind faith begat Merrick and the Dominoes and Ginger Baker's Air Force. You've just given like the complete history of uh, British rock and roll in uh, a single panel. That, that is another great favorite of mine. I History. Was, I was stunned when Emma bought it because I thought, she's too young. She won't know any of these people, but she did. Um, and that, that was a period in my life when music was most important to me. And um, I, I was obsessed with those bands. And so it was such a pleasure to find a way to put them in a cartoon finally after so many years. Um, and I, you know, it's sometimes it's a little tricky having a really long caption, but um, I w it was a, just not so not tricky at all just to list them. So yeah, <laughs> yeah wasn't it wasn't it George Booth and I forget who else once had a once had a contest between them to see who could get the longest caption into the New Yorker, and George I believe I believe George Booth won with something that was like two hundred words long or something. <laughs> Yeah, he has a really wonderful long one um, with a, a typical scene of the uh, guy sitting on the porch and his wife is talking to him. And I can't remember the, the long, long caption where she's, you know, she's generally irritated and stuff. And the last word in the caption is, okay, eat your sandwich. <laughs> That's the, that was the final one. Uh, the genius, the genius of Booth. Um, can we talk a little about uh, about cartooning in the age of uh, Corona? Um, <laughs> does that uh, does that change your um, I don't know the, the the mental process you go through about when you're when you're uh, coming up with ideas every week? Well, it's resulted um, in some specific changes. Um, it reminds me of actually of 9-11. After 9-11, you couldn't hand in a cartoon with a building or an airplane or anything that might cause PTSD uh, for months, actually. Oh. And in the wake of this, you know, when you put two people in a cartoon, you have to make sure that they're not, they're about six feet apart because you don't want somebody, you know, every cartoon is vulnerable to the reader getting caught in the middle of enjoying the cartoon by something that, you don't want them to be caught by. So you don't want people to think, oh, why aren't they six feet apart? Then there's the whole mask issue, whether or not I put them in masks. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. And also, I mean, I have not handed in a Grim Reaper cartoon since this whole thing started. 
yes. and I haven't seen a single one in the magazine, which is really unusual. Yeah. Um, it's because you can't tell if he's wearing a mask. Well, that's right. Ooh, that's a good cartoon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thing, yeah. Uh, wow, I love that. I'm gonna do that. Oh no, I call it yeah. <laughs> Excellent, uh, David. You did do my favorite Grim Reaper cartoon of all time, though, which is the uh, uh, where the Grim Reaper comes to the door and says, "Don't freak out. It's just to save the date." <laughs> <laughs> um. I I say that, that uh, doing cartoons about something like the pandemic is very hard. I'm sure Emily agrees. Um, it's just really hard to do cartoons about stuff like this. Um, there's not, nothing much funny about it. So you, I, I find the way to do it is you tap into what people are feeling about it mm. um, and you go at it very indirectly. Yeah. Um, that's the only way to do it. No, I, I agree. I tend to do it much more from like an emotional kind of point of view. But honestly, what I'm finding hard is like writing stuff that doesn't have anything to do with with the, the, the pandemic or the lockdown, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, um, I feel like one of the hardest things about writing jokes right now is like it's all it's pretty much all there is to talk about. You know, I mean, like um, so it's it, we're all kind of at the same trough at the moment and then you have to kind of like pull yourself out and be like no there are other things there are other things happening yeah yeah in that respect it's like it's like real life yeah you know it's, and it's, you know obviously you know over the past month and a half it's been superseded by the by social justice and processing and everything like that i find it much i don't i find it harder to write jokes um about uh, racial justice than I do about the pandemic. You know, it's, this is, I mean, that, this, that topic is a good one for me to like sit down and listen on more than try to contribute my voice per se. I agree. Right. I, I, I'm having a hard time recalling any recent cartoons on that theme. Mm -hmm. uh, if there have been any, there haven't been, there certainly haven't been many at all. I think that shows up more in the daily since the daily is more, it's supposed to be more of a response to like more what's topical. going on in the current yeah. moment. Like, yeah. Even though I think there's a general sensitivity, if you're going to make jokes about that, you might be better off being a person who's experiencing it directly. Exactly. For sure. Um, but your cartoon, Emily, your cartoon about the, the couple looking at the house and, and saying, uh, I know the schools are great, but is this really the house you want to ride out the apocalypse? Right. It's in, uh, uh, that was that's that was that was very recent, right? That was the... um, that was recent. I sold that before the pandemic, and then it ran after things had had started. So you know, obviously, it has acquired a new meaning of layer, um, uh -huh. new layer of meaning. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I I feel like I tend to forget that things felt pretty apocalyptic even before the apocalypse started happening. So um, you know, the end of the world is something that has featured in my work for for quite some time. Not to brag. The end of the world started on November well, 3rd, 2016, um, actually. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> true, true. Well, uh, uh, which, which David reminds me of, the, of your drawing uh, of your cartoon for the king saying to the court, I don't know much about science, but I know what I like. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a direct response to uh, the gentleman we're talking about. Um, so, yeah. Um, well, that, you know, you said you started talking about him, uh, or you started talking about him literally uh, as soon as he came into office um, when you wrote uh, a piece for the New Yorker Daily, I believe it was, called How to Stay Sane as a Cartoonist in Trump Land. Yeah. Uh, that was written right at the beginning of the, of the administration. And um, uh, where, where, uh, you, you, it was illustrated with a cartoon uh, you'd done um, years earlier that you didn't uh, even remember doing, where, where the caption is uh, when the husband saying to spouse, uh, my desire to stay well informed is currently at odds with my desire to remain sane. And uh, I'm almost afraid to ask, um, but what would you say if you were uh, updating that today? Oh, well, I don't have to update it because... That cartoon, by a mile, is the most 
tweeted, retweeted, copied, stolen, Instagrammed, everything else of any cartoon I've ever done. Every time the world goes into a tailspin, that cartoon appears all over the internet. And I guess what I'm proud about it is that I don't ever have to update it because um, I think, again, I said it a little while ago that when these things, bad things happen, uh, and Emily said it too, I try to tap into the emotional um, part of it, the things that people are feeling. And kind of an amazing thing when you put down in a cartoon what you're feeling and it, it connects to the audience and not only connects, but makes them laugh. Um, and I, that cartoon has done that better than anyone I've ever done. Um, so I don't need to update it. Um, I'm still getting money for it. Uh, congratulations. Well, I also, I also, I also was was thinking of updating uh, the updating your writing about uh, about staying sane. I mean, that was that was an issue three years ago. Perhaps more of an issue today for all of us. Uh, you included. Um, does, does do you feel like cartooning? I I bet you do. I bet cartooning and doing art keeps both of you sane. Do you find it therapeutic, Emily? <laughs> I don't think either of us would say we're sane, but no. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all it's relative. It's a spectrum. Right. Um, it keeps me saner than not doing it, or. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, insofar as I tend to process things that I'm, that I'm thinking about or feeling like through writing primarily and then through drawing, just because that, that sort of happens to be my, my metier. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it, if it necessarily makes me feel any better. <laughs> well. I'm just going to let that trail off. <laughs> well, for me cartoons and writing have it's just who I am it's what I do it's what I've always done it's the way I am in the world and so um, uh, it I don't know if it so much keeps me sane as um, gives my life the quality that I wanted to have um, I, I could not imagine not doing this or doing anything else it's, as I say it's literally who I who I am so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's your practice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Emily, you you do cat cartoons as well, uh, like 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 one uh, we can show that uh, where you imagine various pets, what various pets would be like if they were cats. Mm -hmm. um, cat cartoons are definitely a trope in the New Yorker, uh, uh, like a huge trope, and there, there's just these themes in in New Yorker cartoons that have legs uh, as New Yorker cartoons and possibly in other, you know, magazines. But, you know, there's been so many books about cats, dogs, books. Um, do you have any other favorite single gag uh, uh, cartoon uh, trope favorites, like, like the Island Gags or Rim Reaper, which we were talking about earlier? Or... I don't know if it's even so much that I have favorite tropes. It's just I find the tropes very useful if, I, if I'm if i kind of stuck for ideas. I find it helpful to kind of go back to the tropes and just kind of use those as as springboards, if nothing else. You know, I mean, um, and you might not even necessarily get a gag out of it, but I think it's it's uh, it's like a good, it's like it's like the workout room, you know? Like, it's a, it's a good place to kind of go and, like, you know, work on your basics. Um, and yeah, and every once in a while, you actually like you know crank out a, a desert island gag, and there you go. It's like playing the blues. Yeah. It's a simple form that uh, you can you can improvise. On. Exactly. How about you, David? How about you, David? I, you, uh, I, you know, as I do love the Grim Reaper, I do love Kings, I do love the Desert Island, but what I I I'd say ditto to everything Emily just said, plus. Um, I feel like once in the New York, when you're submitting to the New Yorker, the, the tropes are a kind of gauntlet that's thrown down to you over the years where you want to be the one to do the desert island cartoon that nobody has ever thought of. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm still at this point trying to do that. Um, so almost in every batch, one of those tropes 
will appear with my attempt to achieve that lofty goal. Yeah. So you can like throw down the mic and say, beat this. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, every time you do that, you know there's another wave of cartoonists just waiting to knock you off that desert island back into the sea from whence exactly. you crawled. So <laughs> where the Grim Reaper will pick you up and take you away. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, you, you, Emma, you did a recent, uh, desert, well, what, what, maybe it's not recent, but it's the Desert Island cartoon where, where uh, the guy in the Desert Island saying uh, to the guy who's appearing on the Desert Island, who's washing up on the island, before you say anything, let me tell you which TV shows I don't want spoilers on. Right. Yeah, that was a castaway who clearly has his priorities still intact, so... <laughs> <laughs> And also, I feel like that's a very hopeful cartoon. He might get back to civilization and yeah. catch up on, you know, Breaking Bad or whatever was was current when I made that when I made that cartoon. Optimism springs eternal mm -hmm. in these in such things. Um, the New York Cartoon Competition, which you know, I don't know if anybody expected it to become as huge as it did, mm -hmm. but it's huge. Um, I, I kind of have two questions. How do you guys feel when one of your um, drawings ends up as a, a cartoon competition image? And the second thing is like, uh, it, it's, it's, <laughs> do, 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 do you in a way think that it gives readers the notion that like anybody can be a, can be a New Yorker cartoonist, or at least a gag writer? I think Sam Gross has that complaint, doesn't he, David? Like that, it, it gives people the Absolutely. idea. Yeah, um, yeah. I've actually only ever had something in the caption contest once, and I no longer remember either. I, I submitted it as a gag, and they took my caption away and threw it out to the crowd. I don't remember what my original caption was, or what the caption was of the people that won it, um, but. I do think that people really respond to the um, participatory nature of it. Like, I don't even begrudge them that, you know? I mean, it's like, you know, it, it's like having open mics. Like, why not give people a shot at, um, yeah. at practicing this, this art form? I just want my yeah. dad to stop thinking that I have anything to do with the choosing and like asking me to like, you know, grease the wheels. I'm like, that's not. not. <laughs> it is, it's, it is a little bit like cartoon karaoke, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, David, if, if you uh, for me, I've, I've only, like Emily, but very few, I've, I think I've only had three or four in all these years. I once asked Bob Bankoff why they took so few of mine for the contest. And he said that um, my, my, my cartoons are too specific. They're too... Um, they're just my cartoons and nobody, I couldn't understand it at all. But what I do know is if there were three of them, I know for sure that two of them wound up having a winning caption that was my original caption. <laughs> oh, that's... that's actually true. Like the last one years ago was uh, a guy climbing a blank page. There's nothing there like a mountain climber. And there's someone mm -hmm. looking up at him and the climber is saying to the guy, because it's not there. And that um, was my original caption, and then that was the winning caption. So what can you say? Well, um, and two things about, like, first of all, I think if you're gonna have something in, in like taken for the cartoon caption contest, it's because there's a, a, a strong visual element to the joke. Um, I tend to write a lot of um, what I think Sam, again, calls, uh, uh, he said, she said once. Like a lot of times I'm just writing people, I'm just drawing people to deliver lines that I wrote and there's not necessarily as strong a visual element to the gag that gives somebody something else to like, you know, take that and run with the joke. Um, but, oh, I forgot my second point. Never mind. sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I have a point. My point, I have a point that David, you are not the first cartoonist to tell me that either. Uh, mm -hmm. Other cartoonists have told me that, that uh, the winning captions were their original it's very similar to their original captions. It's all okay because I, what you said about making people think it's easy to do or whatever, what it's really done is has exponentially increased the popularity of cartoons. In exactly, New York. yeah. It has caused 
many, many people who hadn't paid attention to them to pay attention to them. And it's it, it helps people love the art form, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. like, I think it's a, I think it's an absolutely, like, useful and good thing. It gives people, right. like, it, you know, it, it really, it gives them some, in, like, personal investment in it. I think it's, I think it's great. Um, and yeah, that's what I was going to say. I feel like a lot of times, I don't really feel like so much like I wrote a joke. I just picked away at a mountain until I found it. <laughs> so I think that often, you know, like, especially if you're given the setup, like in your example, David, you know, someone's going to keep, now you've shown them where the joke is and they're going to pick there and they're going to, and they're going to find it too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, also it has that, it does that thing that every media, um, that every media form wants. It, it, it engages the audience. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Good for, good for the brand too. Yeah. Um, could I ask each of you uh, which uh, which New Yorker cartoonists of your have influenced you the most? Only of your, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh -huh. Like everybody, for me, Steinberg mm -hmm. uh, made me, he looking at his work made me love to draw, and made drawing seem like a magical thing where anything could happen. And um, I always loved him. Um, I, uh, I, I'm a huge fan of a very nice man who died a couple of a few years ago, Bob Weber, whose <laughs> cartoons, whose cartoons are, um, incredibly compassionate and, um, human and he really understood people and, um, and they're also hilariously funny. So he, he's another favorite of mine that I've tried to emulate in a lot of ways. Um, Sam Gross. Always love Sam. He is the craziest, best cartoonist just about ever. George Booth. Um, I'm sure there are others that don't come to mind at the moment, but um, that's, those are some of the main ones. Yeah. How about you, Emily? Um, I mean, Gay and Wilson is sort of encoded into my DNA um, just from having been exposed to his work like as a, as a very young child. Um, mm -hmm. And I would like, Certainly, I don't think there's any like um, drawing influence, but definitely, I think seeing his work at a young age like knocked me enough off my axis that like you know some, that uh, made me become a cartoonist. Um, but definitely, Roz Chast is a huge you know is a huge touchstone for me. Um, and yeah, I would say that like the three people that have in, in like influenced my work most directly are uh, Roz, Linda Berry, and Sherry Flanagan. Um, and obviously the, the latter two aren't New Yorker cartoonists, but they're just, they're just monsters in a good way. Good monsters. Yeah. Yeah. They're excellent monsters. Uh, uh, what is your, what is your, what would be the last thing I, I will ask you? Um, what is your process like? What's a, what's a week in the life of a New Yorker cartoonist like these days? Uh, a lot of what Emily referred to, the drinking. Mm. <laughs> I, my process is, uh, our deadline is Tuesday at noon, and sometimes towards the end of the previous week, I'll turn my brain. I do other things. I write a lot, so I focus on cartoons maybe on Friday, Monday, and Tuesday morning, and um, I sit around and squeeze my brain. I have, it's a kind of meditation. I don't know what else to say. Sometimes I look at other cartoons. I, I look at the internet, whatever, and wait for those ideas to come sailing in, which hopefully 10 or so will every week. Mm -hmm. um, it gets really intense Tuesday morning, and I find that just being up against it like that is when I do my best work. Mm -hmm. uh, and so noon on Tuesday, I send the stuff in, and then I get drunk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty useless without a deadline. If there wasn't a weekly deadline involved, I don't like, you know, um, I work much better with the stick than with the carrot. So, um, yeah, same thing. I just, I, I try to, I mean, I, I keep a running note on my phone of all of like just things that occur to me um, throughout the week. But, um, and generally speaking, I just try to engage with the world always with like the ticker running of like, is there something in this? Um, and then at, I try to make time to just kind of like sit down and be quiet and listen and hope that like, you know, I can, I can start to hear something happening in all the mulch that I, that I've put in the soil of my brain. Um, 
the process has changed somewhat since uh, since lockdown. Since um, uh, you know, I, I have a seven year old man, and she doesn't go to school anymore, and that's made yeah. things tough. So <laughs> it is what it is. I'm okay. drunk all the time. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, it sort of explains the drinking that, that you're basically always working. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I describe freelancing as like always and not, and never working, like, or never and always, whichever you you know way you want to phrase that. Uh, either way. <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, uh, last thing. What are you What are you working on now? Do you have any new projects that you are? Um, excited about? Well, I um, hesitate to mention it, but I've completed a memoir that um, we'll see what happens. Um, it's been a fantastic two-year journey, um, and I'm very, very excited about it. Uh, that's what I've been working on most of the time. The title? Um, I don't want to say right yet. Okay. Very sure. I'm very excited to read your memoir. Yeah, me too. Thanks. I, I, I've had all this experience writing essays for NewYorker.com and that and they most of them have been sort of personal history essays and that's kind of got me excited about putting a book together. And so, uh, that's what I'm well, your, your, your essays your essays are terrific and I would encourage anyone out there to uh, to, to look them up uh, at NewYorker.com. Um, Emily what's your next uh, do you have the next book? Um, so I, I've also, I, like David, I've been, um, doing a lot of writing lately, um, which has been, which has honestly been really, like, great. Um, I, I mean, not great, like, the writing is great, just great, like, I'm enjoying it. Um, I am working on a proposal for a graphic novel, um, and, yeah, just, you know, I, I try to keep as many things kind of, like, on the go as, as possible, so yeah. Yeah, we'll see, we'll see what works out. Okay, cool. Um, well, I'm gonna say thank you to the both of you. This has been really fun, and I hope it hasn't been too painless for you either. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, that came out wrong. I hope we, 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 <laughs> we know what you meant, Richard. <laughs> yeah, I have to say, I hope we've been weird enough for you. Um, uh, everything is weird. weird. Weirdness comes with every breath these days, so. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thanks again, and um, I'll be in touch. Thank you. Bye, Emily. Bye, Bye Richard. Bye, Bye, guys. Oh, man, that's just delightful. Um, and I, ho I hope this isn't uh, too painless for you either, Richard, our interview. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, Don't have to be Dr. Freud of Vienna to... Uh... <laughs> I mean, it, it makes perfect sense that, that cartoonists would be wonderful conversationalists as well, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Uh, although they do spend a lot of time alone, so maybe it's just, uh, you know, the opportunity to speak with other people. Yeah. Um, now, in the book, you, uh, which I'll hold up again, I only read it for the cartoons, um, Richard Gare, and we have links to this on our website, by the way, along with links to uh, previous um, webinar sessions that you can stream on demand. But you, um, you speak to a lot of different cartoonists from the New Yorker, Edward Corrin, uh, Lee Lorenz, Sam Gross, Roz Chast, George Booth, Charles Barsati, Gay and Wilson, um, Robert Mankoff, and, and several others. Uh, so tell me this, in the process, did you, I mean, you obviously had certain ideas about how, who cartoonists are and how they work. Were there any surprises in talking to them in such detail? Um, there, there was really only one surprise uh, that, that came out of all this, which is that I was truly surprised by how many cartoonists had educators as parents. Hmm. I'd say out of the, the, dozen or so cartoonists I spoke with, 10 had at least one parent who was a teacher. And uh, in the case of Roz Chast, both their parents were teachers. So, you know, take that as you will. I asked a few what they thought about it. Nobody had any ideas, but, uh, you know, statistically improbable. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, how interesting that is. You'd think either teachers or, or psychiatrists, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> or artists. <laughs> yeah. Um, from um, one of the reviews, Edward Corrin, who's a, a beloved photographer at The New Yorker, um, he said about your book uh, and, and about you, uh, clearly Gare has made it easy for us to be a bit more frank than we normally are. And I think it's because he loves the form and is so well schooled in it and its history and takes us seriously. Oh. Well, that was very kind of him. So, so the way you've structured the book is you, you actually did home visits in a lot of cases, didn't you? Each chapter yeah. is a visit with a different cartoonist. Yeah, you know, this book was written in an, in an uh, earlier part of our history when you could actually visit people in their homes. And uh, indeed, I did that. I uh, spoke to people in their homes. I think in almost every case, um, I went to um, Missouri to see uh, uh, the late, great Charles Barsati. And then I went across the river to Kansas City to see the late, great uh, Jack Ziegler. And uh, it was a blast. So here's a, a question. here's a question from one of our, our listeners, and they said, um, are cartoonists different from the rest of us? Yeah, they are. They are. They're, 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 they, they observe more. You know, they're, they're, their job is to uh, report on what they see around them. And uh, uh, I think most people, you know, to, don't, don't go through life with as uh, microscopic uh, as microscopic a, a, a perception as cartoonists do. It's an amazing talent, isn't it? To, to, to encapsulate in a panel something that the rest of us might need more complexity, more time, more space to think about. I began to think of, um, I began to think of uh, single panel cartoons as uh, singles as compared to uh, the albums, which would be like what, a graphic novel or something like that. Um, they also, seem like you know, they just seem like quick blasts of uh, artistic energy, easily digestible. Yeah, yeah. Um, here's another question um, about. Well, it's, it's actually a similar one. It says, um, "Do are, do they approach the world differently than we do, hmm. cartoonists?" Subtle distinction. Yeah. <laughs> are one they is, one is or the, do they approach it differently? Are the two two? Do they, yeah, well, you, the first question was about what they bring into themselves, and the second is about what they uh, uh, sort of take out in the world. Mm. Uh, the, again, I think they spend a lot of cartoons spend a lot of time alone, as do writers. So I could, you know, I could relate. Uh, and uh, so I mean, the New Yorker cartoonists famously used to get together every Tuesday afternoon, and they would. Uh, brought by their batches of cartoons to the magazine and they'd all meet for lunch afterward. And I think for many of them, it was the you know, main social event of their week. There's that wonderful documentary. What was it called uh, that followed uh, Bob Mankoff, the former cartoon editor? And it had that Tuesday afternoon uh, luncheon with many of yeah. them. What, yeah. What was the name uh, of that's, one? Well, I, that's, I, 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 as you said that, I began to feel like, oh, dang, I wish I remembered the name of it. Uh, it was an HBO documentary, and it was very good. And uh, um, Yeah, I'm highly sure. recommended. Easily wicked. Because uh, that documentary, like your discussion now, I, I was glad to see that you got into the question of process. Because one really does wonder how they go about creating so much. And, and, you know, and is it done while on walks? Is it done, it's like Emily said, you know, she'll sometimes just sit very quietly and hope things will start coming to her. <laughs> she starts listening. What, what, what was your impression from these two interviews and from the book about process? Um, I think a lot of them had a, you know, had a weekly schedule because they're professionals, you know. Uh, and and um, Sam Gross, you know, told me that uh, like one day a week, we say maybe it was Wednesdays. He just spent uh, he just spent freestyling uh, in front of a piece of paper and just kind of uh, uh, and just kind of um, you know improvising and to see what he could come up with. Um, I last year the most recent interview I did with a cartoonist was last year when I spoke to um, uh, Ed Steed for uh, the Believer magazine and. Uh, 
Ed Steed was somebody else who uh, you know, says goes to a coffee shop every day and uh, just kind of you know improvises until something interesting comes out. I think other I think other cartoonists have um, maybe a more words come first kind of approach to it. Um, that was the big question in cartooning: which comes first, the chicken or the egg? The words or the the, the, the gag or the image? And, and it varied according to cartoonist. It did. It did vary. Yeah. Yeah. Or or like um, David Cypress says that the gift of being in the Bergen uh, subway station and having it occur to him, you know, in situ like that. Yeah. I love that cartoon. Um, listen, I want to thank you so much for for joining us like this, and uh, and conducting these uh, these two wonderful interviews. Um, you know, and taking the time out to do it. And this is our, this is the Spencertown Academy Arts Center Festival of Books for 2020, uh, all online all the time, because you can stream any of the previously aired ones just by checking our YouTube channel uh, <clears throat> or our webpage at spencertownacademy.org. And we have a couple more coming up. Tomorrow is uh, Ed Ward talking about the history of rock and roll. And on Tuesday, Jill Lepore talking about her book, This America, this, The Case for the Nation. So uh, thank you very much, Richard. And uh, though they're not here at the moment, Emily and David, thank you so much for, for your time. And I uh, really enjoyed talking to you and hearing all about this. Thanks, Gerald. It was my pleasure. See you soon. Bye.